I get this recorded. Okay. So hello all, my name is Mimi Mudd and I want to welcome you to the fifth webinar in our summer 2023 family webinar series. I am the Assistant Director for Parent and Family Programs and Student Transitions and Family Programs, also called STFP. And tonight I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Stone, who is the Director of Disability Resources. Chris is going to be discussing tonight some common challenges that first-year students may face or transfer students might face coming to college, um, gap year students coming to college for the first time, and help you all discuss how you can navigate that also as a family if we have parents and families joining us tonight. We are excited that you've chosen to join us, join us for tonight's conversation, some information before we get started. First, we wanna make sure you know how to submit questions during the webinar. You will see that there is a Q&A feature and we've enabled that. So we have professional staff within student transitions and family programs that's gonna help field your questions. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature. And then once we've gotten our information from Chris, we'll move into the Q&A um, portion of the webinar. Second, we'll be showing a PowerPoint created by our panelists during tonight's webinar. If you prefer to download this PowerPoint and follow along on your own, I will be putting that link in the chat shortly. As a note, in the chat feature, we'll also be sharing other applicable links and email addresses throughout the webinar tonight. Third, this webinar is being recorded live. Next week, it'll be uploaded to the families.wustle.edu website. In a moment, we'll hear from our panelists about navigating common challenges. If something he says sparks a question, again, don't forget to please submit those questions in the Q&A feature. And to make sure we all know how to use that feature, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and plug in the locations from which you are joining us tonight. Okay, I'm seeing a few locations come through. We have Seattle, Washington and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So now I sense you, now since I know you all want to hear more about navigating these common challenges for first year students, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris. All right, thank you. Um, and I am just realizing I do not see any of the um, things when they're putting it in there. So just as I kind of had said before, I was going to kind of probably avoid it. I am definitely avoiding now questions, comments from them. So I don't see them. Um, thanks, uh, everybody, for attending. Um, this is one of those things that I really was feeling was an important topic to discuss. Um, just as sort of some precursors before I jump into it, even though I am the director of disability resources for the purpose of this conversation, this would not be the appropriate time to want to have a conversation about your disability or your son or daughter or student's disability. Uh, please contact our office for those. Obviously, if there are general questions about process or, or things once we've gotten through this information, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, but in a public forum, this is just not the time to have those types of conversations. Also, and Mimi mentioned this, if you have questions that are relevant about what we're talking about to what we are talking about, um, she is monitoring that. I have encouraged her to sort of facilitate, moderate that, jump in if there's something that is appropriate at that time. Um, a conversation is always easier for me than staring at a, a screen of myself and a PowerPoint that I created. So. Um, she may not like it, but I'm going to be looking mostly at her picture on here, so at least I feel like I'm talking to somebody besides myself. Um, so we're going to be talking about conversations around navigating the common challenges for first year and incoming students. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and jump that to the next one. I don't think I can control that. Um, so just really briefly about myself, because you're kind of wondering why do we care what this person has to say. So. Uh, been the director since 2020 at, at WashU. I've been in the field of higher education and disability resources now for just about 20 years, uh, tw actually over 20 years now. Um, but I began as a high school and junior high English teacher, um, which means I'm hyper focused sometimes on the way people write me emails and turn in things in my office because I pay attention to how they write and how they present it. Um, I was an English major. I went to small schools, um, Central College in Pella, Iowa mostly known for Pella Windows, um, not the school, but the town. And then another small school where I had specifically studied post-secondary disability services and working with college students with disabilities, but also just learners, um, 
was a big focus of, of my career in education. And then um, went to George Washington University. I don't think we have any connection to that, but they're both called Washington. They're both named after the same president. So really briefly um, is some information about the office in, in which I work. Disability Resources, DR, you'll hear, or you might see printed, is the designated department at WashU for ensuring equal access and inclusion of disabled students on the Danforth campus and also at the School of Medicine. Intentionally, you will hear that I, I will sometimes interchange, but frequently will say disabled students as opposed to students with disabilities. That is an intentional decision um, to recognize that disablement is a societal factor. Um, it, it puts it front and center. It gives identity. Um, that is not something that I've made up. There's actually some um, very, um, I don't wanna say important, but some people that I trust um, in the field and who identify as, as disabled, and I take my cue from them. Um, it is not meant to be offensive one way or another. And for that reason, sometimes you will hear students with disabilities or a student with a disability as well as disabled student. Um, our role is providing qualified students with disabilities the assistant necessary to enable them to accomplish educational goals and also to get the full university experience. They can connect with us uh, both for helping to navigate that experience. So questions, guidance, um, just walk, talking through a situation doesn't always have to be a challenge, but sometimes a situation. And also we are the office when they wanna come and talk about what reasonable accommodations they may need in order to have equitable access. We do focus on access, not a guarantee of success. That is not a, uh, an expectation that we want students to struggle or not be successful, but our role is to ensure that they have an opportunity to be successful, not a guarantee that um, they always will be successful. Uh, I believe she also put it in the chat, but the link, and it's a short link we made to make it easier, disability.wustl.edu. So talking about this, why do we care? Why are we talking about this today and why do we focus on it? Um, in the past, a lot of the transition challenges that schools would talk about had traditionally been focused on and attributed to those students with cognitive disabilities, ADHD, learning disabilities, other things. Now what we're finding is many of those, those challenges are being experienced more widely by first year students. It is not um, so much related to diagnoses at this point, it's more systemic. This is a change in the student identity. It's a generational thing that's occurring. And there are a number of factors for that. Uh, everything from the way the school system is designed to, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. So the way my parents taught me, which impacted how I now would uh, work with students or children. Um, so it is, it is generational with this population of students. Um, yes, there's absolutely a COVID impact. Is it the only impact? No, it's not. Um, so we have to think of it more as a holistic issue. We are dealing with, with students, with individuals who, who present with some, we can call them symptoms for the purpose of this, that may be similar to ADHD uh, individually. This particular thing might be part of what we would say if they had a whole package of ADHD. Um, we just have to acknowledge that incoming and current students nationwide are having more and more of these individual symptoms, even though they are not disabled, they don't have ADHD, they don't have a learning disability, they don't have underlying mental health or health conditions. Um, doesn't mean that it's not still important to address and that's why it's important that as much as possible, we can talk to incoming students and not only incoming disabled students. I am not making this up. Um, you don't have to trust me, I hope you do, but you don't have to. Um, but some things that are important to point out of, of sort of trying to create some context. Um, this came from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Prospective college students increasingly say they feel unprepared for higher education. 22% said they do not feel ready for college due to a lack of emotional and academic preparedness. That is up from 14% in 2019. Um, can we say that maybe that is COVID related to some degree? Absolutely. Um, there, there has to be some impact from that. I think anybody who has been around students and has been around education can tell you there has been some sort of 
uh, change in that. But I also know that uh, this has been a, a common concern that's been talked about on, common, on college campuses as an increasing factor, at least anecdotally, for more than 10 years, that students are becoming coming to college less and less emotionally and academically prepared. Another important element of that is that 28% of first generation students, those who are the first individual in their family going to college, are saying they do not feel mentally ready for college. Um, this is also, all of this information is also something we commonly hear at WashU. It is not, you know, only those schools, only those state schools, or only community colleges, or whatever it may be. WashU hears the same type of thing across demographics, um, across achievement. So, you know, when we think students saying they don't feel academically prepared, well, you know, a lot of people would say it's because they're they're not as strong as students, but it's not true. We are hearing this across the spectrum of, of academic preparedness and GPA and, and scores like that too. Um, this is from the Higher Education Research Institute's study of first year students, that 46% of students feel, have the intellectual self-confidence that they would rate above average. Now, um, I'm one of those people when I have to look at that, that tells me that 54% say they don't feel that they're above average. 32% um, felt academic ability is average or below. Um, what we know about students going to college, they are generally above average, um, but this is a surprisingly low number um, or high number of people who feel that they are, are below average. Um, a little bit different now, 75% say they're texting and using social media during class. It has nothing to do with, with academic rigor. It has to do with individual pursuit. 38% have rated their emotional health as above average. Wasn't a math major, but that's a big number of people who would put it below average. Um, only 23% of students are saying, first year students are saying they're getting enough sleep or enough rest. Uh, I think it is a common element of college trying to balance health and wellness along with academic rigor and doing all the work. Um, so that's definitely challenging. 35% say they spend six hours a day on TV and online viewing. Um, what I would suggest is maybe get more sleep and rest and cut down on that. Um, but that's independent, that's internalized, that's what an individual can do for themselves. And that 73% are not maintaining a healthy diet. Um, I don't know about you, I don't know who all is here, but I know that when I was 18 years old and when I went to college for the first time and suddenly I was responsible for selecting what I was going to eat on a daily basis, that my diet changed from what it was when I was living at home, where you know, coming to dinner, there was salad, there was a vegetable, there was whatever it might've been, milk or water or juice. And the ease at which somebody can go into a dining facility as, as an adult and select what they want is now about personal responsibility and, and, and changing that. And 73% and of first year students were saying they were not doing that. Again, this is not Wash U specific. And this is something um, that I had only included just before I sent this in because it was on uh, July 20th. New data suggests that institutions overestimate overestimate student awareness of key support services on their campus. So um, what they identified as key support might be the health center, counseling, academic advising, um, disability resources, uh, any number of things, learning centers. Uh, they included in that same article, um, the Titan Partners report where 60% of students were unaware of the full scope of services available, available to them. Um, I, I include this to say it is not that there are not a number of resources and a number of, of uh, supports for students, but there's this mistaken belief sometimes that I will, somebody will tell me about it when I need it. And thinking that the university is going to step in and sort of be monitoring their behavior or monitoring and saying, you're not doing well, I need you to go to the learning center. I need you to talk to your advisor or whatever it may be. Um, a, a misinterpretation maybe sometimes of, of what people talk about loco parentis or in loco parentis, that we will step in, in this legal term, step in for the parent. Um, and while 
you know, it's one thing to say we don't have this, this responsibility in higher ed to, to have that role. It's another to say what we really want to do is focus on avoiding that, uh, that sort of downturn or falling into that cycle or that trap where that's necessary, where somebody needs to try and step in or try and say, we are now um, not trying to help you be successful. We're trying to avoid you not being successful. And those are two very different things. We want to focus on the first one. We want to focus on how do we help you be successful? And in order to do that, what we need to think about is student thriving. And what that means is to fully engage intellectually, socially, and strangely spaced on there, and emotionally in the college experience. Um, what does that mean? You know, a pathway to thriving. What does that mean? It means you're an engaged learner. Um, we can all sit in a classroom and very often the K-12 environment, having been in there as a student and as a, a teacher, um, very often learning can be a passive pursuit. What we need to focus on is how do we keep learners engaged? And that's not only something that the faculty member does, that's something that an individual in the class does. How do you, how do you stay engaged in your learning pursuits? Um, academic determination is a pathway to thriving. Um, that can be as simple as knowing what it is you think you want to study, showing an interest in something, exploring topics, um, talking to an advisor or talking to one of your faculty member about that field, um, finding a mentor or finding somebody who works at the university or works in the community, whatever it may be, to try and put some parameter on what it is you're trying to study and what it is you think you want to do. Um, it's a question that I, I used to have a, a college advisor who jokingly, but also seriously would say, what is it you want to do when you grow up, um, you know, to 20 year olds who feel like they're adults. And it's different to say, I want to be, you know, for me, I, I wanted to be a teacher. Why do you want to be a teacher? What is it you want to do with that? And it, it helped put context, those conversations helped put context to my academic pursuits. Um, what they called a positive perspective. Um, looking at this as opportunity, looking at the whole experience, you know, when we say the college experience, it is academic, it is social, it's environmental, it's relationships, all of that. A positive perspective is looking at that as an opportunity and not looking at it as the doldrums of, I have to go to class, I have to do these things, I'm required to, to go to us to an event or I'm required to do these things because they expect it of me. Um, it's very easy, especially as a high achieving student to sometimes think about these things as tally marks. I need to do these things because it's good for my resume and it's good for my future. What we wanna do is think about a little deeper. These are good because they are good for you. They are good to, to help with connectedness, to, to thrive, to find a sense of place, a sense of belonging, all of which contributes to a student feeling more engaged. Um, social connectedness. This doesn't mean that you have to, you know, be the most popular person or that you have to have a large group of friends. For me as a college student, it was an opportunity to think about what are those social pursuits that were important to me now, as opposed to when I was in high school, when I was in grade school and going to school with the same people year after year after year. I could, I could make new connections. I could make the connections that were important to me as I developed. And then another one, and, and while these aren't ranked, um, the last one on this list, diverse citizenship. You know, thriving is also challenging yourself to learn new things, and it's not always in the classroom. Um, something I think you'll find, um, and they've probably talked about quite a bit at a school like WashU is, is the cultural opportunities. Being in a city like St. Louis, the cultural opportunities. Um, whether it's in the park, whether it's on campus, whether it's going to the Del Mar Loop or something you haven't done before. Um, and just experiencing things outside of the bubble that has always been of comfort um, is an important part of thriving. And I'm telling you what it is and I'm telling you you should do it, but then we also need to think, why does it actually matter? Um, it matters because those things that we can help a student with, um, we can't do it for you and we can't force it upon you. But when a student is thriving, that is one of those, those traits, one of those things that is internalized. If we can help promote that, and if 
if there are parents, I'm assuming there are some parents, you have students here, if you can help promote that, it will have a positive impact on student success. So this is not about, and I put it down there um, because sometimes it's coded language. This is not about feeling good. It's not about coddling. It's not about sort of the, the soft student. This is about the fact that thriving promotes academic success, which we're an academic institution. That's ultimately our goal of this. So I'm, I'm switching now and I wanna talk a bit about some of the challenges. And these are, these are common. Um, I'm happy to talk more or less about certain ones. I don't want this to be sort of a subjective biased rant about anything. So it's more, I just wanna identify them and let us have an opportunity to answer questions if there are any or, or talk through things. Um, common challenges of, of first year students and students coming into a school like WashU, executive functioning. Um, more and more, when we think of executive functioning, it's those things that somebody has to arrange for themselves. Time management, organization, um, things that while somebody can show a skill, an individual still has to own and be responsible for. Um, sometimes related to that, or I would say associated with it, is that their high school habits don't translate to higher education. So they were used to cramming the night before a test or staying up all night to finish a paper or doing homework in study hall and turning it in later that day. Or I went to a small school and it was easy for me to sort of just get some breaks here and there. Um, if I didn't have something done, um, not having good study habits, not, um, not necessarily recognizing that college learning is different in the amount of, of reading, independent learning, note taking. Um, when we think about learning, we think about um, analysis and synthesis of information. So I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I have to think about it and I have to make sense of it. High school learning doesn't have a lot of that. Um, and that can be a challenge for some students, especially if, if the first time they're encountering it is day one of their class. Um, communication it sounds very simplified and I intentionally less it, left it very simplified. Um, communication, which means both how you talk to your friends, how you talk to your faculty and the people who work on the campus with you, um, how you communicate with your faculty, uh, recognizing that there are different ways of communicating and different ways of effectively communicating. If you're struggling with something, being able to communicate what that is, um, being able to communicate things that you do well, things that you don't like, um, being able to communicate if you're having roommate conflict. Um, prior to coming here, I worked with an individual in housing who uh, we were stunned by this and you know he wasn't, but we were, he was the one who worked in housing and said he had to, he had to navigate and um, mediate roommate conflicts because the two people would not turn around and be angry at each other. Instead, they would text across the room and just kept ramping up, but they wouldn't just address the problem, problem within the two of them. Um, because if you haven't had to deal with that interpersonal communication and, and conflict, communication in those situations is, is difficult to be vulnerable and also to say, here's, here's what's bothering me, here's what I need. Um, stress management and emotional prepare, preparation. Stress is normal, stress is good. Um, however, if you haven't had a chance, not that you can't do it, but haven't had a chance to sort of build those skills on how to manage stress, how to recognize when it's becoming too much and step back and bring it down a bit, that can be challenging. Emotional preparedness to deal with um, arguments, to deal with relationships, homesickness, any of those kind of things can, can be a challenge. Um, technology literacy, our students year after year after year are using more technology and technology I've never heard of. I now have to put myself you know, right smack in the middle of, of middle age as much as that pains me. But what we're finding out is that while students use a lot of technology, they don't always have the same ability to use that technology for educational purposes. And that's, that's a distinction. Um, how to do simple, what I would consider simple things um, that might be needed for academics, for research, for communication, um, that can be a common challenge for students. Um, 
something that we we know about all too well, um, not just with students, but with population in general is imposter syndrome. Um, students coming in have been, I mean, you're at WashU and we have uh, making a very broad claim, some of the best and the brightest. And when you put that together, um, it, can be, it can be really challenging to feel like you belong, to feel like you deserve this. Um, I've, I've encountered it myself, I, and, and I mean for myself, not just people telling me about it. It can be difficult and, and feeling like you belong and that's something that's very internalized and how do we help a, a person feel that? Um, adjustment and what I, I just like this word, discombobulation. Um, it, is, it is all new. And whatever you knew before, if this is not familiar to you, if you're from a different city, different part of the country, different country, different culture, um, all of those adjustment challenges um, that can be opportunities, but those challenges happen all at once. And, and, and it's something a lot of students deal with. It doesn't matter where they're from, who they are. Um, part of it is recognizing that challenge. Uh, the next one is, is one that I, I put for both, both sides of the family relationship, dependence, independence, and letting go. Uh, nobody is asking parents to sort of just, you know, drop off and then step back and say, you're on your own, hope it goes well. Um, but at the same time, what we all need, including your student, is that, that independence, that stepping away and responsibility shifting. And a shifting responsibility is different than no responsibility. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And, and I talked about it a bit under communication, but more broadly managing conflict. This can be with people. This can be with conflict just in the sense of um, difficulties, navigating a situation, um, navigating processes. Um, part of adulthood, it seems like, is just dealing with situations that sort of suck sometimes. You know, how do I finish this and, and fill this out in time? Who do I have to send this to? What's the next step in this thing I have to do? Um, I, I get night sweat still thinking of FAFSA applications and, you know, registering for classes and all of that, which luckily I no longer have to do. But all of those things are conflicts you have to, you have to manage within a day, within yourself, um, trying to do all that and, and work with people. And, and that is, can be a barrier if you're not equipped to deal with it. So I'm gonna give you the most simplified fixes to this stuff. Um, and I, um, I don't mean it to be, I don't, and I don't mean it to sound flippant. Um, sometimes I get that way, so I apologize. But I think some of these things, the reason we're pointing it out now is because recognition is, is often the most important part of it. It's not just simply saying that people can't do it. It's that actually having to think about it and be intentional in it. Um, from a lot of the information we, we talked about and that I shared earlier, part of it is just self-care. It is, it, it is emerging adulthood and responsibility. So practicing self-care, sleep and rest, healthy eating, moderation, um, Parents, you can, you can plug your ears if you want, but your students are going to do things that you don't want them to do. Um, they're going to potentially drink things you do not want them to drink. Um, what I'm saying is we can't sometimes stop that. We can educate and we can say moderation in all things. Um, hygiene and cleanliness so, sort of seems, again, you know, flippant, but I don't mean it that way. Um, Self-care is important. It's good for your health. It's good for your long-term health. Um, not being, not getting ill, keeping your room clean because environmental factors impact health. Um, thinking about managing your stress, not avoiding your stress. Um, if, if you have participated in any type of competition, any type of sport or things like that, and you've had adrenaline rush, that is, that is the physical response to stress. That is not a bad thing. What we what we hope and what we want to be thinking about is how do I manage the stress and how do I utilize it? Um, you know, we talk about things like resiliency and self-efficacy and recognizing the challenging situations when they occur, when you have a positive experience with, with a challenge, with a, a stressful situation, we learn from that that we have the ability to continue to manage stressful situations and be successful. 
So the more often we're challenged in, by stress and we're successful, it helps us be more successful with it. Um, part of that is leaning into it and not trying to just avoid it, not trying to look for a way around it. It's how do I manage these types of situations most effectively? Um, developing strategies for time management and organization. All of these things so far, you're gonna see sort of feed into one another. So when I think of things like managing stress, part of management of stress is having good organization and time management. Part of practicing self-care is having a schedule where you actually say, I have class from 10 until 11.30. I have lunch at 11.30 until 12.30. I spend a half hour of sort of decompression time, whatever it might be, and then I have class again. Here's when I work, here's when I work out. Um, and trying to develop a schedule where sleep is an important part of that and not an afterthought. I am as guilty as anybody when it comes to that um, in my student life, in my adult life. I recognize what it does to me when I, when I don't get that and when I don't get good sleep and good rest. And, and all of those things, um, when done well by the people who do it the best, comes down to management and organization. And something else on here, and um, nobody likes hearing it, but embrace the failure and, the le and, and embrace the lack of perfection. Um, we are arguably, you know, surrounded by brilliant students. I, I am amazed sometime that I work at a school I could have never gotten into. So when I think of this, I think about we are dealing with the, the top, you know, five, three percent of, of a student population in their, in your classes, you were always in that top percentage. Um, again, I was an English major. I wasn't a math person, but I know statistically it is impossible for everybody to still be in the top 3%. And that can be challenging. Um, and embrace sometimes when things don't go the way you want, whether it's a grade that's not as, as good as you want. Um, you've, you've gotten in trouble. You didn't get the one role you wanted, or you didn't get accepted to the thing you wanted accept that, embrace it. Um, I hate stock phrases like you learn more from the failures, but one of the things I certainly learned more about myself was when those things bothered me, when those failures bothered me, what can I improve about whether it was my, my work, my training, um, my communication, whatever it was, learn from those things. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to, to kind of embrace that. And then the last one, which is, which is a big sort of all-encompassing category and is going to take us into the next slide, is metacognition. Um, I just love this word. Um, one, because I, I wasn't actually sure for a really long time if it was a word, but I love the way it sounded and I love the explanation I had from one of my, one of my faculty when I was a, uh, in my graduate program, when I was going through my master's to work with students and to be a, a learning support for students beyond just being a, a teacher. Metacognition, it's that thinking about thinking. Um, you know, to say we're getting meta about something is sort of to go interior to it and really get deep, thoughtful of it. It's this awareness and understanding of what you need to be successful. So it is everything from, this is what I know I'm good at, this, this is what I know I like, to um, when I talk to students and when we talk about preparing for the, for the year and preparing to be successful, what environment do you need in order to study? Um, when you're working, do you like quiet? Do you like background music? Um, great, you like music. Can you study when you have music on though? Um, what type of music? What type of room? Um, can you work in the library? Some people, quiet, sterile environments are too quiet and sterile and they can't focus. If you put me into a, a quiet room with no music, um, I want the chair to be comfortable, but not so comfortable that I feel relaxed, but not so uncomfortable that I'm thinking about the fact that I'm uncomfortable. Um, I need some type of background sound on. If I don't have background music, I start to think too much about the fact that I can't hear anything. There's nothing going on. Um, are you better in the night or in the morning or midday? And all of those types of things um, are conversations you can have with people and, and you can develop um, abilities to be to do it more intentionally on your own. But it is important to think about what do you need in order to be successful? Um, something that we, we focused on and, and developed several years ago uh, at a previous institution I worked at, when we 
specifically we're talking for uh, disabled students, but is something that I've used with other students as well, if we want to go to the next one, is this idea of self-authored transition planning. This is something those, you know, you, you are still, um, I'm assuming for the most part, while there may be some people who are already here, this is something where you, you haven't necessarily transitioned to WashU yet, many of you. And these are things, these are conversations. It's not necessarily a, uh, a worksheet to fill out, but these are conversations or things to be thinking about, things to be sort of journaling or scribbling out, having conversations between parents and students, you know, thinking about those strengths. What are my strengths? Um, the reason we wanna know about your strengths first is because once you know what those are, you can address deficits more easily. I know I'm a really strong writer and I'm a really strong communicator, but I know I have a hard time with mathematical information or scientific information. Okay, so we know you, you do these things. Well, how are we gonna lean into those to help us be successful here? I know if I'm, I'm more verbal than I am um, uh, written. So if I'm working in a group project, maybe I'm, I'm suggesting, hey, I can really help us be more successful by doing more of the presentation piece because the writing is something I sometimes struggle with. Um, doesn't mean you avoid it, but it means you recognize it and, and you try and um, rely on as much as possible. Um, what are your areas for improvement? Those skills you know you need to improve that are gonna help you realize success. Um, it can be, I just need to be more outgoing and speaking to my instructors. I need to actually ask for help. Um, I don't think as a, as a male, I can ever say that I was willing enough to ask for help and I'm probably still not. And it's a difficult thing because it's an ego thing for us. We are used to being successful and independent. Asking for help, that, that's something I know I need to improve on. Um, I need to improve sometimes on my time management. Um, I know I'm a procrastinator. How do we get a, around that? Um, preferences, the ways you learn most effectively. The way I learn best, the ways I learn best, okay? Are you somebody who likes to, when you're studying, do you create study guides? Do you like to make games out of it, flashcards? Do you like to study in partners or pairs or groups? Um, all of those types of things. I know I'm good in classes where it's participatory, but when I'm just listening, I tend to not uh, be as engaged. Um, I know I take good notes, and so I like utilizing that, and I like to, those classes where, they, where I have to do more of my own work like that. Um, these are all just things that you think about and you prepare, not because this is changing your strength or changing uh, your preferences. It's an acknowledgement of it um, because we often don't do that. We often sit down to read our first, you know, reading assignment for a class and we haven't thought at all about how to approach reading, how to approach this class. Um, this syllabus tells me what the expectations are, but I've never really thought about how to do that before. Uh, this is a way to, to help with that. Um, and, and something that um, I, I leaned on a lot um, as, a, as a first year student. And I had, the, I had the benefit of running cross country. So our, our cross country team had to show up for college about three weeks, four weeks before the rest of the students came. So I had a coach and I had an assistant coach and I had some teammates who were upperclassmen that, that I'd gotten to know. Um, and so it was easy for me to, to do this in some sense, but they also helped me develop more fully, more, for, huh, more fully. Um, who do I go to for help? This is not a single person. This is what's my network. You know, when we think about what's my 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 web of support. Okay, I know this is my advisor. Um, I know this is the person who I talk to when I'm just struggling. Um, do I use University Learning Center? Okay, that's my contact. Do I? You know. Um, if I have a coach, if I have a, uh, a secondary advisor, if I have a counselor, a um, religious um, support network, anything like that, it's putting those things in place in your mind and having that available so that when you encounter those times when you might struggle, you're not searching for, for resources. You've already kind of got an idea of this is the friend I, I know I can talk to about, um, you know, the Kind of the difficulties I'm having maybe in a relationship or this is the person I know in my class that I can go to because they have a way of explaining things to me and we work really well together. Um, 
part of this, it could be for some students that disability resources, one of our, our um, coordinators or one of our assistant directors or me is one of those support people. It's not always, but when I think now and, and often people are um, thinking this, you know, well then what is our role and what is our role as a parent and what is our role as the university sort of, and, and I talk about this. Um, I do not necessarily study my student development theory as much as I'm supposed to, um, I admit that, but one of them that I really like is this concept of challenge and support and that it is our role and you as a, a parent, you know, when we talk about dependence, in, independence and letting go, it is your role to challenge your students to extend beyond the comfort zone, whether it's academically, socially, um, being away from home a little bit longer or further from home. So this idea of challenge, but not leaving them out on an island to, to struggle, not leaving them out there to flounder. Um, really briefly, one of the ways I explained it to a, a, a faculty one time, because we were trying to think about what's that line, you would never put somebody into a weight room and give them so much weight that they're gonna hurt themselves, but you are gonna give them more weight than they've done in the past because stress is growth, that, that challenge is growth, but you don't wanna send somebody into, you know, again, fatigue, because once you put them into fatigue, now you've, now you've killed development. Now you've made it so there's nothing else that can happen from here. Um, so when I think about it and what I would challenge you as families and uh, parents and things and, and students for that matter, is this idea of challenge and support. Um, just go beyond what's comfortable, feel what's out there, let yourself you know, figure that out, um, challenge them so that they um, have to do it, but then support them so they don't fall um, and feel like it's a negative experience because none of this will be a negative experience. I have the utmost faith in you know, our student population. I always do, and, and we're rewarded by that. Um, and there, there's only one last thing I put on here and it's because I really just sort of like this and I try and find every opportunity I can to use this last slide. Um, there was somebody that created this thing called Skeletor's Love where they like to put um, uh, sort of like self-help on top of He-Man. And, and the simple idea, progress, not perfection. You, you are going to experience things that are challenging and, and difficult. And you're going, to, you're going to have good experiences from those. The experience itself doesn't always have to be right. It's always to build upon, um, get better and better and better. And that's what four or five, or if you continue going to school, school is gonna be, should be for you, is, is this idea that we're continually trying to progress. We don't expect you to be perfect. Um, and you have to allow yourself that as well. So um, I am looking at the time and I realized um, where we're at. Hopefully we have some, some questions or some discussions that we can, we can go to for, from here. Yes, thank you, Chris, for all that information. I have a question to kind of kick us off. And then we have some pre-submitted questions from parents, family members, students who registered, and then just a reminder to all of our attendees to feel free to use the Q&A feature tonight as well to submit questions live. So the question to kind of kick us off is in general, when should and can a student who's in need of resources and or accommodations reach out to WashU? Is that something they can start over the summer or do they need to wait for um, academic? Sure. So, if, so if we're talking about disability resources, um, sooner rather than later, um, what I would suggest is if you are waiting until the year has started, you're already gonna, you're going to be, and I, I don't mean behind in that you don't have an opportunity, but it would be, you want to do it during the summer because if you're waiting until the year starts, it means those first few weeks, we're probably not going to have anything in place that you may need. So if you haven't already, um, and, and this is something you think you may need, whether you know you do or not, please follow the link that Mamie provided. Um, this is for the student to do. So parent, you're there to support them not to do um, and submit a new registration. Um, there is an opportunity. You'll, you'll answer some questions about um, you know, the, the type of challenges you experience, how the disability affects you, uh, what accommodations you think you may need or that you've used in the past in either K-12 or another school. And on a screen following that will be an opportunity to upload electronic documentation um, if necessary. So 
Um, but if you need to, by following that link, you can also find our contact information for the office. I would do that. If you haven't done it, um, put that at the top of your list of things to do. You can do it at any time during your college career. Um, there is not a, a cutoff date. However, when that information is received is going to impact when things may be available um, and accommodations are not retroactive. So if you do not contact us until October, we can't do anything to put an accommodation in place for things that may have occurred during September or up to that point. Um, so that, that's one thing. With some of the other things to, to be less DR specific, I would also say um, contacting things like the counseling center, the learning center, your advisor, those types of things before you actually need it um, and doing an introduction, getting those services set up. What we know from things like learning centers is that um, good students use the learning center to be better students. The people who go there tend to not be students who are struggling. So that's sort of one of those myths, one of those um, fallacies that only, only bad students go there. Actually, it's B students who wanna be A students, C students who wanna be B students. Um, get set up with them early before you need it so that those things are in place. Get, if you think you wanna to talk to somebody just because you're thinking transitions maybe gonna be a challenge or maybe I just wanna have this network in place, do it before you need it um, because everybody starts to feel the crunch at the same time. And though when, when you know hundreds of students or tens of students are all trying to connect with the learning center at the same time or all trying to connect with counseling at the same time, it's gonna have more of a delay. Thank you. Okay, so we also had a question that was pre-submitted about, in general, how long it can take to set up an accommodation. Um, it sounded kind of general. I'm assuming you can speak more in depth about disability resources than maybe some other like sure. resources yeah. on campus. So, um, so the time frame is is going to be dependent on sometimes the time of year uh, when things are received. It's also going to be dependent on the nature of the, of the request and the information that we're provided. What we tend to say as a general practice is that, is that we strive to respond to student requests within 10 to 15 business days. Um, at times of the year, that is going to be much shorter. And at some times of year, because of the volume, that's gonna be longer, which again is why we, we promote, if you're coming in now, get everything sent to us early, not when you arrive because there will be a, a number of students who do that and that will delay the turnaround time that we're able to meet for students. Um, I know for instance, right now, we're getting 10 to 15 new submissions a week. So while we are processing, processing those fairly um, quickly, it does mean that the volume starts to, to become larger and larger. Um, and I would much rather we get behind in our 10 to 15 days now and not in September and October. So we had a question from a parent or a fam family member about um, the best way for their student and maybe for them to support their student and navigating living with people they do not know coming to college and having a roommate and or suite mates. I, I am, um, I am a, a firm believer that I have lived my entire life with stranger danger. It was probably taught to me by Saturday morning cartoons um, who, who had those little things about avoid strangers. Um, new people is hard. <laughs> and, um, and generationally, students um, do not share rooms as frequently as they used to. Um, they don't, they, they've had the same friends for years and years and years. Um, Sometimes I think the best thing to remember about that is coming here and being around new people is the same for the new people as it is for you because everybody's encountering that at the same time. Um, I think if you talked to upper class people and whether you do that, um, had opportunities or not, but talking to other people, I think you'd hear the same sort of thing is, is be open to an introduction. Um, introduce yourself, navigate um, boundaries. You know, when I talk about communication, it's meeting your roommate and talking about, hey, you know, just, you know, what do you like to do? What kind of, you know, um, are you a late night person? Are you an early morning person? I got lucky in that my roommate for my first two years of college, he and I had about the same sort of schedule. We were both people that like to work late at night, 
Um, he had classes early in the morning. I had classes later in the morning. That's the difference between an engineering student where I went to school and an English major. All his classes that started at eight, mine started at 10 or 11. Um, but we knew each other's patterns and we had to negotiate those types of things. Um, the best thing to do, honestly, and, and it, it always sounds so flippant, but part of it is, is be open to introducing yourself to people and just saying, hi, do you mind if I, do you mind if I sit here? Um, being in your, in your residence hall and not keeping your door shut all the time and being open to conversations with new people. Um, challenging yourself to occasionally go somewhere you haven't been. So that first week students are here, there's gonna be a lot going on for a large part of the beginning of, of their experience. And not only doing the things that you're used to doing. Um, if you've never been to a soccer game, go to a soccer game. If you've never been to a football game, go to a football game, go to Forest Park with people. Um, you know, go to, go to Del Mar Loop and find a restaurant or someplace that, that is not um, you know, McDonald's Steak and Shake or a pizza place you've always gone to your entire life. Um, all of those things and, and you know, taking people and, and being open to that, that's, that's the best advice I, I ever got going into college was, was just be willing to meet people and be uncomfortable with that, you know, lean into it. I hate that phrase, lean into it. I gotta stop saying that. So next we had a question about um, what types of resources and potential accommodations WASH you would have for students who are experiencing specifically social anxiety. Um, so this is probably not the, the venue for that because what I would say is it depends. Um, there is not a, a, a set finite list um, what I will say is our responsibility is first to, to confirm, can we confirm that there is a, a disability or a diagnosis and a disability or diagnosis where we can identify that there are barriers to access. Um, based on that, then we start looking at what accommodations might be appropriate. I would, I would say um, that person, the best thing you can say is um, that student or that parent should have their student contact our office to speak with somebody. And then we got a question specific to celiac and I would say they asked about academic extra time. So same thing there, reaching out to, to disability resources, having the student complete that form. Yeah, it's, it's really gonna be, you know, when, when somebody is looking for an accommodation an accommodation is a retroactive fit to address a barrier. So we aren't determining it based on the fact that there's a diagnosis. We're basing it on how does it impair something? How does it affect something? Um, not to say that there, there may not be um, academic accommodations for that, but it's going to be dependent on whether it's celiac or anxiety or ADHD or um, any other chronic health or physical or cognitive. It's going to be based on that student and the expectations. And can we find a reasonable accommodation that removes a barrier? Um, it's not about preference or ensuring benefit. It's can we, it about removing a barrier for access. Um, with something like celiac, if you have not done that though, be in contact with uh, the nutrition team and dining services. They are one of our number one contacts when we are looking at certain types of accommodations with students or to determine if accommodations are necessary, including things like meal plans. Um, they have a capacity to meet a number of student needs. Um, often families don't think about that. They're, they're sort of a, afraid that if they're not at home, they're not gonna be able to do an eat or whatever. Talk to the dining team. They're amazing people. They are um, waiting for you to contact them. And I'll put a little plug in too for parent and family orientation that we have coming up. The um, dining services I know has two specific events, both on Friday and Saturday. So the two move in day options um, about like allergy friendly kitchen tour. And then I think a specific presentation from the nutrition team about that as well. Right. People who have dietary restrictions and or allergies. Yeah, and it's, I'm sorry, I'm gonna start coughing. So I'm gonna try and mute this if I can get it done. And then um, I can move on to our next question too, which I have another plug for, and then I know you can answer as well. The question is about disability resources and if they speak to prospective students about common accommodations offered for students. 
Um, I just wanted to plug the resource fair that we have on Sunday of parent and family orientation, disability resources. I know we'll have a table there as well. And then if you want to answer that as well, what opportunities um, there are for incoming students to learn about the resources and accommodations offered. Yep. The, um, you know, I'm a broken record and I think you're going to um, hopefully it, it makes its way in. If you have questions of whether it's about specific needs that you may have or the potential whether or not you want to connect with our office and self-disclose a disability contact us set up time to speak with one of our professionals who can talk with you um, we will not give you a you know when i think about it we don't necessarily say these are the accommodations you're going to have because until we have the information until we have the ability to evaluate that we're not going to give a guarantee like that um, i don't want to give you false impression. It's more we can talk about, here's what it may look like, here's what some students sort of generally may, may have for something like that. But until we can evaluate the individual's request and information, it is all sort of just general information like that. Great, thank you. And then I have our last question for the evening. Chris, again, thank you for the information you've shared tonight. Our last question is, if you have one more tip to kind of add for parents and families as they prepare to have some conversations with their students this summer about these common challenges that may or may not arise as the student transitions to college, what would that additional tip be? Um, I, I, I think, you know, um, authentic conversations about what's going on is, is the thing. Um, I made a career basically out of having conversations with my parents where they said, how's everything going? And I would say, fine. Um, you know, I, I had nieces and nephews that worked, that, that went to schools I went to and their parents would say to them, what'd you, what'd you all do today? And they'd say nothing. Um, and in the, the way you have those conversations are going to be important, you know, hey, not just how's everything going or, or what'd you do at school today, but tell me, tell me something that that you're finding you like that's going on at school or tell me, tell me something that you're doing different at WashU that you haven't done before, whatever it might be. Um, be thinking about those things. Um, parents, make your kids start getting up on their own um, between now and the time they show up to college. Um, start transitioning to getting up. You know, do they know how to do their laundry? Do they, you know, kind of that self-sufficiency stuff? It seems so minor, and then it's, um, and then it's not. Um, but sort of handing off some of that stuff and just start expecting them to do these things. A lot of people are doing it, and I really appreciate that they do this. I've been, you know, I've been doing that on my own forever. Um, but those types of things, the routine of it, I think, is more important than the fact they're doing it. But just the routine of getting back in the swing of having to do it when when school and your life is not as regimented as the high school system was, where you're not going there for eight hours a day and then coming home, you can have these, these odd schedules. Getting into a routine of managing that uh, is, is the number one thing I think um, going to college, I wish I would have done more effectively. And, and then I'll plug this too. Um, and then if you're not talking about it, start talking about study abroad. If it is a wasted opportunity if during your college career, you are not thinking about the opportunity to study in a, in a different area from someplace you're used to. Great, thank you. Chris, the information you've provided this evening was very helpful. I'm confident the families and parents and students who joined us learned a lot from your presentation tonight. Families just wanted to give you a reminder that you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar on our families.wusil.edu website. And also at the website, you can register for our next um, webinar, which will be this coming Tuesday, August 1st. And that's a conversation about move in and fall welcome. We hope to see you all then. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. I hope you all have a good night. Bye. Thank you.